The past hangs heavy over Bizen, one of Japan's oldest ceramic centres, where pots have been made for the last 800 years. Koichiro Isazaki is one of its rising stars, and in this exhibition we'll be seeing not just what present Bizen has to offer, pots that are contemporary, fresh and modern, but also we'll catch a glimpse of its future. I hope you enjoy this exhibition. Welcome to our latest ceramics show here at the Goldmark Gallery, an exhibition of pots by Japanese potter Goichiro Isazaki. Goichiro hails from Bizen in Okayama Prefecture in Japan. It's a ceramic centre that's been going for at least the last 800 years, probably longer. And it's a potting centre that has been adapting, changing, evolving over all those many hundreds of years. Koichiro, in a way, had both a fairly conventional introduction to the world of pottery. His father is an extremely well-known, established potter. In fact, one of the few living national treasures in Japan for Bizen ware. And his grandfather was one of uh, several potters to sort of see the revival of ancient Bizen pottery in the mid 20th century. But Koichiro came to potting almost at an oblique angle. When he left home as a young student, it was to study sculpture at university. And for a number of years, he worked as a carver in wood. And it was during that time that he first came to the realization about uh, working with a particular material. Why am I working in wood? What are its qualities? What am I trying to express in wood that I can't in anything else? Having not thought that he would become a potter, he returned home and realized that here in the Isisaki compound, where his father worked, where his grandfather had worked, here were all the materials, the tradition, the uh, experience, the knowledge base, the culture around him, all ready for him to adapt, change, and bring some new, fresh life to. In this exhibition, we'll get a hint of that um, knowledge of materials, that real sort of uh, special relationship that a potter can develop over a long period of time with a very narrow, limited uh, set of materials and working methods. When you speak to Koichiro, tradition, dento, is a word that is often on his lips. And I can hear you already a collective groan in the distance. Not tradition again, that word, it pops up all the time when we're talking about pottery. Not another story about hundreds of years of pots being made and developed and evolved. But the story of Bizen ware is one fraught with with danger, with struggle, with survival. It's one in which great successes and great lows uh, in its history pepper a very sort of long period of, of difficult struggles within the community. In fact, one of the prominent aspects of the local landscape are the ruins of the old kilns from the Middle Ages to the um, sort of Renaissance period of, of Japanese pottery in Bizen. The great Ogama kilns, these enormous vast tunnel kilns that were once set across the slopes in this very sort of mountainous area. It's an area that Bizen potters are familiar with. Goichiro walks there uh, often to uh, see the, the sites of the old kiln and to look at the vast graveyard of pottery shards from pots that have been made over a long period of time. 
it's here that you have evidence both of Bizen at its very height of its production, when many thousands of utilitarian pots were being made every year in giant kilns that could hold up to 35,000 pots at a time. But it's also where you get a glimpse of the world of pottery in Bizen that was at one time abandoned, a, a tradition of pottery that became defunct, uh, no longer fit for purpose in Renaissance Japan. For a long time, Bizen pottery has had to fight to get back to its roots, to unearth traditions, methods, uh, processes that were once long buried in those vast kiln ruins. Goitro is now one of the vanguard taking those processes and creating something completely new with them. Historically, Bizenware pottery is unglazed. It's uh, fired in large anagama kilns, wood fired, and it's that wood firing process that vitrifies the clay but also gives it a kind of surface glaze. It's the fly ash in that volatile atmosphere of the kiln, fired over a very long period, numbers of days, that produces the varied effects on Bizenware pottery. Now, it's not simply down to a sort of arbitrary tradition that that's the way Bizen pottery has been made over these number of years. In fact, it's partly due to the clay itself. There are two distinct types of clay in the Bizen area. The first is uh, found in the rice paddies at a sort of two, three metre depth. It's a very fine, sticky, malleable uh, clay, um, uh, fine for, for working with. Another clay further up in the mountainside in this mountainous region is much rougher. It's grittier, it's got a sort of coarser texture, but it's very refractory. It can be fired at high temperatures and withstand them. Blends of the clays together have been used by potters for many hundreds of years. And between the two, you get a, a, a kind of clay mix that's uh, good for making figure potterines, for making small scale pottery uh, like this. It's also a clay that can bloat, it can sag, it can blister in the kiln, it can, it can crack and collapse in on itself. It's a sometimes difficult clay to work with and potters have their own independent blends. They have become sort of adept at finding the right mixture of these two clays for the particular work that they're making. That gives some kind of idea of the kind of tradition that was there laid out for Koichiro when he came back the tradition that he'd seen his father working in for many years, and which he would have seen his grandfather working in too. One of the wonderful things about this clay, though, is it has a, a high iron content. And that means that in the flashing atmosphere of the kiln, where a raw flame is working its way through a path of pots, where every pot has an individual shadow uh, of where the ash is hitting it and where it's being shaded, protected by other pots around it, you get a wonderful varied effect. It's very clear from each pot whereabouts in the kiln it's been, what sort of effects it's undergone. And each one tells a kind of different story. You can see from these pots here that there's a, a great range of colours being drawn out, a great range of different textures and surfaces. Now in Japanese pottery, these come under sort of collective terms. You'll have heard the word yohen before. It's a word that basically means kiln change. But it covers a, a vast array of effects that can be wrought by a, a wood fire potter who knows how to use his fuel, who knows how to stoke, how to work ashes through the kiln, who knows where to place his pots and how to direct the flame between them. Many of these different effects have different names and we'll see a few of them around here in this exhibition. You'll see on this little tokuri, this sake bottle, a kind of speckled effect. There's some lighter brown spots up here and these darker ones beneath it too, over this orange blush here. This speckled effect is often referred to as goma, which translates as sesame seed. And a lot of these phenomena that we see on wood-fired pottery in Bizen have these different names, names that sort of refer to other things in, in, uh, in the real world. So for example, here we've got a pot where an area has been masked off from the fire using perhaps some wadding, or it's been sheltered by another pot. When these marks, these shadowed marks, 
where the ash hasn't been able to build up, where the flame hasn't been able to scorch the clay and we haven't got these brilliant orange effects. These areas have got particular names and when they're circular like this, they're known as botamochi, a rice cake spot. You'll also see from these pieces next to me by Koichiro that the clay can be masked off from the flame entirely. These pots, these three forms here, which come under the Yo series, which is a, a term that sort of means gestation. These have been housed in sagas. They're sort of like small bowls almost, or containers, which keep the clay uh, masked from the flame. And you can see that they've been sat on uh, maybe uh, ground up uh, rice straw. That's given them this red blush underneath. These pots give an idea of how Koichiro is taking uh, the limitations of the materials, of the ways of working that have been established in Bizen for many years and finding new ways to express himself in clay. Well, we'll get onto that more in just a minute. You can see from the very contemporary forms that Koichiro has been exploring in this series that he's one of many potters who are taking the old established ways, the materials, uh, the processes, the ways of firing from the past and finding something new to say in them, finding a new way of expressing himself. And you can also see, perhaps, the influence of his time studying sculpture. After his return from university, Goitre spent a, a, a few years working with his father, getting to know uh, the particular ways of working in Bizenware, before then going and apprenticing with Jeff Shapiro in New York, who had himself been apprenticed to one of his father's apprentices. He knew Jeff from his childhood. There were family connections there. But exposure to a completely different culture and time in the West, I think, had its effect on Koichiro's work. It meant that when he then came back to Japan, he could look at some of these questions completely anew. What does Bizenware mean? What exactly does tradition encompass? You'll see from some of the pots on this shelf that we've got uh, some guinomi here, some vases, but also chawan. And really the story of the tea ceremony is intimately connected to the story of Bizen itself. It was when Japanese tea ceremony really flourished in the Renaissance period of, of Japan's cultural opening to the world that Bizen saw both its first major successes as a sort of uh, a, a center of, of art ceramics production but also its swift decline. The very nature of its clay meant that it couldn't be glazed, it couldn't have the kind of flash sophisticated glazes uh, that old Chinese ceramics had which were then being uh, used in the tea ceremony were uh, very much a, a sign of sort of the cultural wealth of the elites who were practicing it. But then the tea ceremony changed and a style towards something a little more aesthetic, a little more natural, uh, works that were less shouty, less sort of uh, flourished, and more quiet every day, uh, became the new fashion. When potters of Bizen realized that this was a, a growing trend, they soon adapted their processes of making simple, everyday uh, pottery in their kilns looked for the very particular effects, the sort of the way that ash can drop and, and uh, create varied, subtle surface differences on their pots. And they very quickly became another center of highly sought after tea ceremony ceramics. You can see from this chawan over here, which has these beautiful facets to it, which really let you see the sort of the texture of the clay itself which is almost stone-like. You can see the amazing variety of colours in what is at first a fairly unassuming pot. There's this beautiful blue-grey shadow to it here, which combined with this deposit of natural ash, which gives these beautiful sort of dun, farrow, 
bokeh colors. It's a very sort of quiet, contemplative combination. The taste for pots like this in the Japanese tea ceremony did not last long. It wasn't too many years before competing tastes, competing schools of tea ceremony style, competing uh, patronage of different uh, warrior elites soon saw many different styles of tea ceremony evolve. And very quickly, Bizimware, which had been at a height of popularity, was suddenly finding itself neglected once more. And really, that started a very long period of a downward decline. It's only in the last 100 years, really, that that particular era of Bizimware pottery has been revived. You can probably also tell from the great difference in colours of these pots here, the different colours of the clay, the different effects that have been brought out in a single firing, that blending one's clays, making the most of what's there on offer to him, is a vital part of Koichiro's practice. In a way, tradition has limited him. It has limited him to the clays that he can't change, the fire he can't change, the kiln technology, which is, although contemporary, essentially the same as it has been uh, some five, six hundred years ago. It then comes down to how can he make his own individual choices within those parameters, blending his clays himself, working out what combination of clays dug from the rice paddies and the mountains, what places in the kiln he's going to be able to achieve the effects that he's looking for. It's there within those parameters as they narrow down that you start to see the individual voice, the individual expression that is Koichiro's work. If you come round this side here, you'll see that one of the fundamental things he has going for him is the fact that although the fire can't be changed, although the kiln can't be changed, the clays can't be changed, clay is a fundamentally malleable, manipulable material. It's a medium that gives itself to almost infinite variation. And so here we see it in many different forms. We have these lovely fluid, sort of fluted marks on this vase and this beautiful water container, this mizusashi here, with its lacquer lid. This is where the ability to, to work through clay very easily, to bring out different textures, stark contrast from the wood carving that he would have been used to as a student. You can also see from uh, the very simple forms of his chawan, very different from the very carefully structured, built up shapes of some of his vases. And then once we get to shelves like these, we see clay really being explored in all its variety. There's several of these tall vase-like forms throughout this exhibition. And it's this combination of squeezed areas, of these bulbous areas, playing with volumes sort of things that we talk about in the world of sculpture, contour, volume, mass, they all lend themselves to the firing. They all provide different kinds of surfaces, different kinds of transitions between one shape to another, which completely change the way that the fire moves around the pot. They change the way that ash deposits itself on the pot. And so they give a very different kind of movement around them. They tell a very different story of the firing itself. It's also here on these shelves that we see two pots that really show off one of the key features of Bizen pottery, Bizen decorative pottery, which is Hidasuki. That's this sort of coiled rope-like pattern over this pot and this vase down here in the corner. It's very characteristic of Bizen ware. And it's yet another aspect that dates back many, many years, essentially to an old function. There is some debate about the issue, but 
it's thought that potters in Bizen traditionally did not use wadding, clay wadding, uh, a sort of refractory clay to separate their pots from kiln shelves and from each other to stop them from sticking to each other. They would often use instead rice straw. It would be wrapped around the pots themselves. And as the kiln temperature rises, those bands of straw would leave these sort of ghost-like impressions as they're burnt off in the firing, these scorched marks on the iron-rich clay. And so what was once a function, what was once a utilitarian practice, has been adapted over many, many years, and used, exploited as a decorative feature. And it's another aspect that offers almost infinite variation. Depending on the way the straw has been wrapped, you can have very sparse arrangements, like on this vase, where these red lines cut across these sort of larger, paler mass of this pot. Yeah. Or they can be used at the base of pots to offer variety. Here, combining with this speckled goma appearance and the flashing that you see across this vase on this other side here. When you know that you're working within an established vernacular, when there is already a vocabulary laid out for you, when the materials are set, when the processes are set, what becomes vitally important is that you are reflective, uh, you are looking outside the scope of your own traditions for inspiration, for influence. One of the things that Koichiro uh, revealed in uh, some of his interviews um, leading up to this show was that he has a particular interest in film, uh, particularly that of the work of the Japanese director Yasujiro Ozu. Ozu was a very famous Japanese filmmaker. His films around the sort of 40s and 50s, very much character-driven stories looking at the way that Japanese society was changing then in a very tumultuous period in its history, a period that lines up, funnily enough, with the Momoyama revival, with a revival of interest in Bizenware pottery itself. What characterises his films are a very, very focused structure and set up to his shots. Almost all of them are static and they're intersected by lines and angles, a setup that is completely plot driven, character driven, that is designed to tell very silently, very, very quietly, the story of these different relationships that are going on, relationships that are reflected in the relationships of space. Now you can see that in some of Koichiro's very contemporary work, his sort of large, modelled, sculptural pots here. These two that we've brought here together as a pair almost look like characters themselves. They feel like two people having a conversation, a dialogue. The way the clay has been coaxed to fold in on itself. This sort of relaxation, the twisting motion in the pots. They're as character-driven as any shot in a Nozu film. And it shows Goichiro finding a way in the limitations of his material, his medium, of expressing something very deep and very human, as well as finding something new to say in a long established tradition. It's often said of wood fired pottery, in particular pottery like this, that appears sort of on first inspection, particularly if you're not familiar with it, to be a sea of brown pots, that the real pleasure, the real delight in it is in the nuances, it's in the little details, it's in the varied effects that small changes in atmosphere can have on the same material. Here I think on shelves like these we can see the great variety of what Koichiro is able to coax from his kiln. We can see some of the very subtle effects of ash falling on pots, pots that have been sheltered away in the midst of others. 
And we can see also how the ash at the very highest temperatures can drip and pool to make these glassy beads and surfaces, which I'm sure our viewers are very familiar with. What I love about this show though, what I love about these pots is that although these are effects that many of us are in a way really familiar with, effects that we've seen have been brought to the West and that Western potters have very much adapted to their own needs. It's in Koichiro's use of form. It's in his very fresh way of thinking about clay, of structure, of bringing the things that he's learned from the world of sculpture and that sculptural eye to his work that means that these same effects feel very different. They enliven in a different way. I love the way on, on this pot that this area that's been shielded from the clay, this pot which has been fired, lying down like this. Having thought through the, the packing of the kiln very, very carefully, Goichiro has been able to keep this side of the pot pretty well clear of, of ash. And so you get the clay almost as it was dug from the ground. And then very quickly, this transition of effects here, the speckling of more and more ash, the deep reddening of the clay, and this beautiful fringe of glass beads that are just curling over this side here. And all those layers, that that very quick transition from pure clay to the effects of the fire, the effects of the ash, can be read in a completely different way on the clay, on the, on the vast form, once it's standing there. And so back to that question, Dento, what exactly is tradition? What does it represent? What does it mean? In what way is it more significant than simply the inherited materials, the processes, the kilns, the ways of the past? Well, I think in Koichiro we can see in his pots his own belief on, of tradition in that it is a living thing. It's not simply an inheritance because, of course, it doesn't die with him. It will continue on from him. It's not just something that he is being having passed down to him, but it's something that he will then continue and give on to the next successor, to the next generation. As a result, tradition is something that has always had to adapt, it's had to evolve, it's had to change with the times. It's used certain parameters, certain limitations, and found new ways of exploiting them. I quite like Koichiro's father's way of describing it which is that tradition is an accumulation of creativity. I think you can see in Koichiro's pots where that creative stream has been uh, has allowed to run, the way that it's been applied to a great variety of forms. And the way that he's given us these sculptural forms which are on the one hand feel kind of natural, some of these large vases feel almost like giant pumpkins or gourds. They feel like something that's sort of grown from the ground up. Some of these vases remind me almost of the sort of stamen and stigmata in, in flower heads. And then others give me the feeling of almost like old armour. It's something that's been very carefully battered into, into shape, this sort of rounded, clean shapes. They feel almost more industrial, like they've been formed almost like a, like a, a Brancusi head. But I think my favourite of his forms and a signature process that has become part of Koichiro's vocabulary himself are these pulse vases. These have been created using a pug mill from which he's extruded cylinders of clay, hollow cylinders. And these can then be brought to large moulds. They're almost like beds that he's created with these patterns in them. The cylinder, which is then still wet, it's still malleable, it still uh, can be changed very easily, is then almost slapped down into the mould to leave this textured surface here, this pattern. 
this sort of grate like pattern here. And in the process of hitting the clay down, that also affects the form itself. The clay collapses in itself, it flattens towards the top. This is a really beautiful example. This has been fired sitting down, I think, in a bed of something which has, which has brought out this beautiful colour here in the clay. And this side which has been shielded from the ash, the embers, the heavy ashing from stoking that's fallen on this surface and giving it this beautiful pockmarked appearance here, which is again almost like stone. It's almost like lichen on the growing on the surface of an old stone or old rock. This has been Ko Ichiro's first solo exhibition in the UK. And as I've walked around it, it's the same phrase that's come to my mind. It's a very famous one. It's often attributed to Mahler, but it probably predates him by a number of years. And that's the idea that tradition is not the veneration of ashes, but the passing down of the flame. In the case of the Isizakis, it's a, a very literal flame that's been passed down. It's the same fire that's been burning in Bizen for 800, 900 years. But when we look around this show and we see the sense of form that Koichiro is bringing to Bizen Ware, his sculptural sensibilities, combining very new and different and unseen forms with the familiar patterns of flame and ash, the behavior of the kiln, it's here that we see not just, I think, contemporary Bizen ware, but the future. Koichiro gives us a glimpse of where Bizen pottery is going in the years to come. And that's really exciting to see, I think. Before we go, I'd just like to say a quick thank you to the three people who've helped me see these pots through new eyes and opened uh, the world of Bizen, the Bizen history to me. That's three people who've written for us on Koichiro's work. You'll see their work reproduced in the catalogue for this show and in our latest autumn magazine. So my thanks go to Dr. Nicole coolidge rusmanier at the Sainsbury Institute, to Masahiro Karasawa at the uh, National Museum of Art and Craft in Japan, and to Dr. Robin Wilson in Oxford. Between the three of them, they've really helped let me see these pots in a new light. There's no way that we can ever convey quite with these films the, the depth of uh, surface textures, the range of colours, the feel of the pots in your hands. But I hope from this brief preview that you've got a little flavour for what Bizen has to offer and what especially Koichiro has to say in his medium. I hope you've enjoyed today. <laughs>